Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, <clears throat> thank you to Basis Foundation and Federico especially for uh, adding me to the program late. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, come from Canada and the United States where I, uh, I do my, my primary work. And uh, I have nonetheless as a philosopher a strong interest in entrepreneurship and economics. And increasingly in the last few years I've been spending a lot of time at economics conferences trying to engage with, uh, of course, the many important practical problems we have right, uh, with uh, world economies and world political uh, problems. And what I want to do today is make a suggestion that as important and difficult intellectually, uh, it is to understand the economic and political problems of nations like Argentina, that philosophy uh, is an important part of understanding why some countries do well and other countries do not do well. And if I may have some uh, professional uh, pride about my discipline, that really the most important reason why some countries do well and other countries do so poorly is philosophical. So I'd like to make that argument right today. As a philosopher, of course, we ask right, all kinds of value questions, right? What is the meaning of life, right? And as thoughtful people, we, especially when we are young, right? We think about who we are, who we want to be, what is possible, and out of the many possibilities, right, that we each have in our lives, we choose some things are going to be the most important. And if we are thoughtful people and passionate people, then we make a commitment to a certain small number of core values that are going to govern our lives. Uh, these involve religion, they involve ethics, they do involve, of course, politics, they do involve family life and economics and so forth, but it's a very philosophical right, movement right, that we make. And so while philosophy does have a reputation, of course, for being very abstract, and of course it is, and in some cases irrelevant and silly, and some philosophies are, in fact, irrelevant and silly. Nonetheless, uh, the decisions we make on those issues have enormous practical influence. Right. Now let me start with some economic data, because that's what we want to connect to here. So here's a graph from a couple of years ago. Along the bottom, we have 2,000 years of human history. That's perhaps 1% of all of human history. Uh, <clears throat> so year 2000, 1,000 years ago, here, lifespan of Jesus, uh, the transition of the Roman Republic into the Roman Imperium. Uh, on the vertical axis, we have population, uh, 1 billion, 2 billion, and so on. The green number, the letter is small, it's a uh, US dollars 2012, I believe, uh, best social science calculations for what productivity was per person around the world. So what this tells us is that in year zero, there was approximately 200 million people in the whole world, and they were all making and living on about $467 a year. If you had gone back another 2,000 years, that would be a flat line. Another 2,000 years, 4,000 years, uh, you go around this auditorium six times, I did the rough calculation, the number is essentially a flat line, all of human history. You go another thousand years into the future, essentially no change. You jump five to six hundred years. Now Columbus has crossed the ocean. We're into the modern era of globalization. Things have started to change. Right? This number is now 566, which is a modest increase, but a 20% increase is a significant. We would all like to have a 20% raise if we could get that. Then another 100 or so years, the number continues, and then look what happens in the last 250 years or so. Straight line up. Never happened before anywhere in human history, and perhaps the most important intellectual historian question for all of us to think about is, since we are the heirs of this, we are living now right in this world, uh, why did that happen? Why did it happen at this time, right? And not at any other time in human history? And why did it first start to happen in some countries, like England, 
and then a little bit later in Scotland, and then crossing the ocean or the channel to France, and then crossing the Atlantic Ocean to countries like Canada and the United States and so forth, and not in other countries, right, around the world. Right? Because if we think living in grinding poverty is a bad thing, and if we think that prosperity is a good thing, well, of course, that's a philosophical value judgment, uh, then we're living in good times. And knowing why we're living in good times is a very important question. Now, I want to narrow the focus a little bit here because that was world total averages. I want to just look at the uh, Americas. Here's the Bolivian numbers, 2014 American dollars. Average Bolivian right, lives on $3,150 per year. It's the poorest right, in all of the Americas. And when we go there, we are struck by how awful the poverty is. But it is worth thinking that the average about nine times, right, as wealthy as the average person was throughout much of human history. But that's the Bolivian number. Paraguay and Guatemala, a little bit better. Then another chunk of How's that? There, we're back online. Good. All right, so here we have uh, another uh, series of countries, but notice the uh, orders of magnitude are important here. Right? These people, on average, are two times as rich as the people here, right? a doubling. Right? Why is that? Then another group of countries here, right? on average, three to four times right? as rich as these nations here. And then the two most successful Latin American nations, currently Uruguay and Chile, uh, these numbers are from a couple of years ago, but uh, you're going to be four times as rich right, as right down here. So already an enormous spread, and figuring out why this is going on uh, uh, is, uh, is, 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 of course, important to everybody who is involved. But to get us a little closer to philosophy, I'll start with my home and native land of Canada, where I was very fortunate right, to grow up. Here's the Canadian numbers. That then is to say the average Canadian right, is over three times right, as rich as the richest of the Latin American nations. Right? And then that the average right, Canadian right, then is living in wealth that is almost 16 times as wealthy as Bolivians. Right? Huge, why is that? And these numbers are consistent right across right, many decades now. And then here are the American nations are the American numbers, which are slightly higher. Canadian numbers and American numbers tend to uh, track each other. And these are consistent numbers right, across right, many decades. And we do know, right, in a rough and ready sense, that culture has something to do with it. Right? That economic performance doesn't just happen by magic. Right? That uh, econom economies are embedded right, within certain political systems, right, within certain cultural systems. Uh, uh, and so the numbers that we are aware of, then what we need to do is to try to track right, what is going on culturally right, in places like this that's not going on in places right, like this. And here I think philosophy is an important part of the story, so that's where I want to turn to next. All right, uh, we look at the raw numbers, right, and then we do economic analysis, and uh, those of us who are market friendly, right, uh, liberals and so on, we like to make a connection between economic performance and the degree of economic liberalism right, in a nation. How easy or difficult is it to do business? If you want to start a business legally, can you get your permit in one day or does it take you three days or does it take you three months? Do you need to bribe people in order to get your business permit? If you want to get the electricity turned on. If you're a woman, are you allowed to open a bank account right, in your own name? Are you allowed to hire people and fire people right, very easily or is this enormously difficult and so on? So are any number of uh, uh, metrics right, that we can use to measure degrees of economic freedom. 
And one measure uh, ranks all 180 something countries around the nations, around the world, and then fairly consistently in the last decade or so, here are the most five or the five most economically free places in the world: Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, Switzerland, and Australia. Uh, I'm going to have a history question for you. Uh, think about this, but what do five out of those six have in common right, with each other? Right? We'll come back to that in just a moment. Here's the top 20, right, adding Canada, right, United Kingdom, United States. We have a number of European nations, mostly Northwestern European nations. And then we have uh, um, Canada and the United States. I want to, though, notice Chile, right, is in there. And Chile entered into the top 20 about 15 years ago and then into the top 10 about five years ago. Uh, now, if we go down then to the bottom, right, 25%, right, around, then we have countries that are the Latin American nations, and we can then start putting a hypothesis forward. Nations that are not economically free, right, that is very hard to do business, remain poor. Right? Nations that are economically free, right, become prosperous. All of these top 20 nations are extraordinarily prosperous, and we do know that these are among the poorest, right, nations right in the world. Now, what does that have to do with philosophy? Well, we're getting closer. Here are the two uh, top two Latin American nations. Chile, of course, is in the top 5% now. Uruguay is uh, in the, uh, the top 20%. And so there's correlations there as well. Another piece of data, though, is not directly economic, but uh, to focus on corruption. Uh, this is just a quick heat map, right? Red is bad. These are the places where you have the most corrupt people in business and the most corrupt people in politics, and usually there's an unholy right, alliance between those two categories of corruption. We know people who are engaged in corruption are not engaging in economically productive activity. They are bluntly parasites. Right? They are a drain on the economy because they extort and extract right, wealth or they grant favors that do not add to uh, economic productivity. So you would expect the most corrupt places in the world to be underperforming right, economically. But then by contrast, right, uh, uh, sorry, this is unfortunately Argentina right down here, as you know, the yellower places are the places where you have a much lower levels of corruption in politics, much lower levels of corruption in the, uh, in the business world. And there's a correlation then again. The places that are cleaner are more wealthy. Right? So if you clean up your ethical act, right, so to speak, in business and in politics, you become more prosperous. If you fail to do that, right, you don't. So ethics, right, not just economics, has a lot to do with it. Now, I want to uh, use strong language here because I think it is repulsive that in the 21st century, we have so many underperforming economies and people right, living in poverty. If we consider North and South America, there is absolutely no reason why South American nations cannot be and should be as wealthy as the North American nations. It's not natural resources. They both have awesome natural resources. All of them are very new countries, just a few centuries old right, at most. All of them are populated by uh, uh, largely immigrants, right, who came from, right, all over the world and so on. So we have smart people, we have hardworking people from all over the world and awesome natural resources. If you then have an order of magnitude difference of four to five in terms of economic productivity, there's a problem there. And I don't think there's an excuse for it among people who should know, right? Now, we, of course, we point our fingers at, thank you, politicians, right? Lots of bad politicians, they know better, right? They know how to do politics without accepting bribes and doing favors and so on. Lots of corrupt businesses and so on. But I want to point to intellectuals here. I want to say the biggest problem Latin American nations have are their intellectuals. Uh, because it's the intellectuals, right, who train the politicians, who train the business people, who train the teachers, who carry, so to speak, the culture, who say these are the important things in life, this is how you are supposed to think about what your life is all about. Well, what's the answer to that question? What do these have in common with each other? The top five of the six. Any suggestions here? 
Common law, okay, and what nation is most associated with the common law tradition? Great Britain, right? And the point is that the five of these six are former British colonies. Right? If you go to the one outlier, of course, is Switzerland. If you go to the top 20 most prosperous and economically free nations around the world, 11 of the top 20 are either Britain or former British colonies. Right, and so the point I'm going to make is that, of course, imperialism and colonialism, good things happen, bad things happen, but there's a huge difference between the kind of cultural exports right, that the British were engaged in when they were going around the world right, and engaging in all sorts of attitude. And the point is going to be that the British right, institutionalized British culture and British philosophy, right, and that that philosophy took hold and that the philosophy includes an economic component, but it also has something to do about politics, right? about education, about morals, about religion, about all of the important things in life, right? the British way of doing things, right? more or less was captured in various places. If you look around the world and ask how many former Spanish colonies are in the top 50, right? well now there's two. And there are dozens that are no longer, right? And that is a very recent phenomenon. Former, former Portuguese colonies, z zero. Former German colonies and French colonies, zero. Right? Uh, and what's the point? What I want to argue is uh, all of these guys are right, philosophers, right? And one very philosophical scientist, right? And these are the guys who in uh, the 1700s and late 1600s, so to speak, conquered the intellectual world and developed a new philosophical framework right, that was interconnected, uh, <clears throat> that became predominant in Great Britain. It was imported by Voltaire largely into France and spawned an enlightenment there. It was institutionalized in all of the British colonies, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and so on, and the results then are formalized. But you'll notice that this point about limited government, right, that's a political point. This is a point about religion. This is a point about economics. This is a point about ethics. Right? This is a point about ethics. Right? This is a point about epistemology. This is a point also about epistemology right, applied. It's a whole philosophy right, of life that takes hold, right? that becomes integrated and the dominant view. When you look at the world through this lens, so to speak, right, you think about all of the important issues and all of the important issues differently than and this is going to be the other side of the divide. On the other side of the modern philosophical world across the English Channel and the continent, here are the dominant thinkers. All of them are philosophers. Right? And if you are an educated person in the continental tradition, this is, these are the people you read and study deeply. Right? And let me just give you a thumbnail on a few of them. Jean-Jacques Rousseau thought that being an individual was a moral sickness, that we all have an obligation to put our whole body and mind in the service of the collective. He believed in the censorship of all of the arts, that all of the theaters should be shut down. He thought there should be one state religion, and if you disagreed or indicated disagreement with the state religion, you should be killed. Right? How anti-liberal is that? And yet, how many people in Latin America know Rousseau and study Rousseau? He is a major one. Immanuel Kant right, uh, uh, argued that the pursuit of happiness was immoral, right, that one should engage uh, uh, in actions only right, out of a sense of duty, and that you best know that you are doing your duty when you are not happy, right, and so on. George Hegel right, believed right, that people uh, were selected by God, certain special individuals, to rise up and take their nation to the next historical level, and that they were beyond morality. And anything they do did, including crushing and killing tens of thousands or perhaps even millions of people in order to further the state's purposes on Earth, was justified. Marx, we all know right about Marx, right? Human relations are marked by conflict that we cannot fundamentally, I understand, thank you, sorry, uh, uh, to understand each other, that we are in a, a, a life or death class conflict and the only way to make progress is through a violent revolution, in which case we're going to kill the vast majority of our political enemies. Nietzsche, philosopher, right, of power, 
Freud, right, the thinker on irrational drives and instinct, right, is fundamental, right, not reason. Uh, these guys are all very deep, right, are philosophers, but I'll just point out right quickly in case you don't know, Heidegger was a Nazi, all right, gung-ho, true believer in National Socialism and supported Hitler in theory and practice. Sartre was a communist, Foucault was a communist, Jacques Derrida was in theory, right, a communist, but he did not actually join the party. These are, in the continental tradition, the intellectuals you read and understand if you are a well-educated person. Economics is a part of it, right, but it's only a part of it. And this is an entirely different philosophical world from the Anglo-American tradition. And my final point is going to be, if you are a university student or a college student or a high school student in Latin America, all of your professors, this is a slight exaggeration, the vast majority of your professors are well-educated in the continental tradition and they know very little about the Anglo-American tradition. Unfortunately, I verify this from my personal experience and when you read the textbooks and so on. The point is, they are very smart, they are very well educated in one half of the library, right, so to speak. They don't know the other half of the library, they do not teach it to their students, and when you are living in this intellectual world, the implications for politics and religion and economics are very, very different. This is uh, Buenos Aires bookstore, right? I took it on my last trip here, the philosophy section. Right? Uh, these are the featured right, books here. Every single one of them is a continental right, thinker. Right? And then there's one additional book, this red one is Che Guevara. Right? Right? This is a symbol right, of what you are supposed to. There's not a single Anglo-American philosopher on this entire section does not exist. You, of course, you can buy the books, but you have to go out of your way to find them. And that's my point to you as students. You are thinking about economics, you are thinking about politics, those are deep and difficult issues, but you are going to have to, if you really want to understand why Latin America is the way it is, why Argentina is the way it is, to go out of your way to seek out the arguments and the positions on the other side. There's a much larger philosophical world. To understand economics well, you have to understand philosophy because a lot of philo economics is done in the context of certain philosophical traditions. And you're going to have to, since everything is controversial in economics, everything is controversial in politics, everything is controversial in politics, go out of your way to get yourself educated in the other right, philosophical traditions, see what the alternatives are, and see what the practical implications right, of those alternative philosophical and cultural traditions have been in various countries in the world. Learn from the best experiments right, around the world, and then import those ideas and institutions into Argentina, and then more broadly into Latin America. Yeah, you underperform. Right. Uh, everybody can be Canada, everybody can be the United States, but the ideas have to be right. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Thank you.